Thanks, everybody. We've got a good number of people here. Thank you all for joining today. And we're going to keep this moving. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, all of GSAP and Lila specifically, and to the, also the Public Design Commission for supporting this research and publication and event. And uh, to Raul Gupta, who is an MARC student at GSAP, who edited and assembled the materials and was in the original seminar. Um, and as well to Andrea Tonk, who was the TA and is an associate in our office, um, who produced part of the uh, PDC's Designing New York series with support of uh, Columbia PDC um, and the book, which also features um, as we go to the next slide, um, contributions to or contributions from GSAP uh, students in the seminar. So designing New York uh, prefabrication in the public realm, and that's really our key tag that I want to focus on here today. I'm going to introduce briefly and then we're going to hear from our guests and then have some discussion. Um, this discussion, uh, which was published and launched uh, recently as a collaboration between both Columbia University uh, and the New York City Public Design Commission is available as a free download. We've got it posted here on our website. Uh, I mean, in the chat, I should say, and also here. Um, and it examines how prefabrication practices can be applied to small scale urban infrastructure projects to have, and here's what's important, large public realm impact. That's really what we're interested in here. It also presents current best practices for prefabrication and analyzes both technical and logistical nuances of these systems in order to further understand their viability in New York. So that's also a key, a key um, issue for us is that viability in New York. Um, so today we've invited uh, four designers from around the world, which is really exciting, who will present their projects highlighted in the, that are highlighted in the publication along with perhaps others and together with some discussion to further open up um, the, the issues and the projects and uh, the future of prefabrication practices in densely populated and expanding urban metropolises like New York City. So that's also kind of our key lens that we're looking at. Um, and this is all in order to meet our growing needs, both in responses to climate change and COVID are, and we have some examples of that uh, for public infrastructure, which are also addressing press pressures to expedite timelines and reduce costs, which is always the case when you build something. So these are all projects that are built. Um, shown here in the image is a project on our cover by Garrison Architects, um, a New York architectural firm. It desi it's designed in response to Superstorm Sandy. Um, there were 34 floodproof structures at 13 sites that were built. Um, here is shown at Coney Island and other citywide waterfront sites. Um, they were constructed in five months with one month installation and it had a lot of help from an administration that was very keen on doing this. Um, we focused on uh, recent developments that have evolved in the last 10 years. Um, and one of our models as we began was the 2008 uh, MoMA exhibition and publication Home Delivery that's shown here, uh, Fabricating the Modern Dwelling, which was curated by Barry Bergdahl um, of GSAP and Peter Christensen. Uh, there are many examples of houses and housing when you start to look at prefab and modular, um, but less so of public infrastructure. So that's where really is our starting point, kind of last 10 years, public infrastructure. Um, and I want to start by showing a few projects, just a few that are in kind of key projects that are in the publication before we go to um, our guest. And I'll just do those quickly just to kind of give us kind of more material here to think about. So this uh, Venice La Library and Culture House by Helen and Head Architects uh, in Venice La Norway was constructed on a very constrained urban site, if you see it. It's really interesting. Um, it was a, shown here as the, some of the construction sequence and it's a glue lamb wood construction, construction structural ribs that you see. Um, what's really interested, interesting is how those are then creating these um, kind of reading caves or shelving both so that the rib is the structure, it creates the shelving, it creates this reading cave. So that was one of our um, examples that we had um, used as um, a kind of exemplary model in our, our publication. And then um, this La Chia Auditorium by Renzo Piano Building Workshop in La Chia, Italy. This is a very remote site 
and it is a wood construction, um, a timber frame and a laminate wood facade. So all these laminates. So uh, you're not really getting the full effect, but this is kind of in a, in a really mountainous area. It's kind of up by itself. So the thing is brought in as a total piece. And then these laminate strips are put on. The foundation was already there or not already there. That was obviously part of the first construction that you see in the first diagram. So um, this is a kind of super interesting structure. And then we have to show this project it is a house, it is a dwelling, but I can't not show this project because um, it's constructed of um, infrastructure pieces that are kind of left over, let's say. Um, it's the Hemeraroscopium project. Uh, it's by the Ensemble Studio. It's in Madrid, Spain, uh, made of precast steel and glass, uh, factory assembled four months big pieces brought to the site, one month on the site for assembly. Um, so this is like a, a small building trying to be a lot bigger than it is by being made of, you know, pieces of highway infrastructure, um, which, you know, is incredibly cool, I think. Uh, this project in a completely other location, site and climate in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, called the Power, Power Parasol at Lot 39. Lot 39 is an existing parking lot next to a very large stadium where a lot of baseball teams practice in the off season um, by DePolo De Architects. It is 20, 217,000 square feet of civic shade. Uh, and it's both an energy generator and a billboard. Uh, Di Bartolo has patented the connection pieces. It's made of a galvanized steel structure with bolted connections. And it allows for, um, which when somebody thinks about something, if you're ever doing something like this, is how do you maintain it? How do you swap out panels when they're not functioning? Um, everything, all of these 7,600 photovoltaic panels that cover this existing parking lot for 800 cars can be serviced from below. So that's a really kind of key element um, also in this design. It's really, really beautiful. I've been there and if you go to Phoenix, check it out. It's fantastic. We need this in New York. Uh, I'm trying to get this in New York. I'm not, I'm not having success yet. I'm still working with the design commission. Um, this is a whole other scale, something that is constructed in five days in a site um, in an existing kind of uh, auditorium space, paper partition system by Shigeru Bon and his Voluntary Architects Network in Yokohama, Japan. Five-day assembly on site, his cardboard tubes, his paper tube construction where he's patented connections um, fabric. And so what is this? It's not actually, it's actually having to do with, it's a COVID response, but it's not where COVID people are. It's for, um, people who this typically in all night cafes uh, in Yokohama, they provide shelter for people, uh, offering them couches, computers, and some showering facilities for people who stay overnight at an affordable price. With the surge of COVID-19, um, the authorities shut down these cafes, leaving people homeless. So Shigeru's Voluntary Architects Network came up with this system um, to house people who are te temporarily dis dislocated um, from these cafe spaces, which is, I think, incredibly cool. Um, Shigeru also, and you may have seen this, this I think was in the New York Times, but um, it's not in our book yet, but we want to put it in our book, um, is public toilets that there was a competition in uh, Tokyo for uh, comfort stations in public spaces, specifically for the 2020 Olympics. And this is a controversial design that won. <laughs> Um, I still don't know if it's going to be actually constructed. This is one that is constructed. It's uh, using a tinted smart glass wall, which creates transparent effects when it's not in view. I don't know if this is working, if, if we click on this or if the next, there it is. So it, it makes translucent, goes from translucent to transparent with this electrified glass. Um, and Shigeru's comment is that you know, everybody can see how clean it is. Like who wants to go into a public restroom when you have no idea what it looks like? Do I want to open this door? And so um, you can see inside before you actually go in, which, which is incredibly cool. So those are our examples. And I want to introduce um, Rebecca Makla, who is our uh, 
my partner in crime here on this whole project and Rebecca Macklis, and she was a, she is a senior urban design manager at the Public Art De Commission in, for New York, and she's going to tell us a little bit about that and other things that we do there. Thank you, Laurie, and uh, thank you, GSAP, and, and for having us and everyone in the audience for carving out some time in your afternoon. Um, firstly, apologies, there's local law 11 happening outside my window, so I'm going to keep it brief for the noise and to save room for the discussion. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little bit of background on the Design Commission and um, our Designing New York initiative and effort and how this research into prefab fits in um, to our work and charge and um, partnership with GSAP. So as some of you may know, PDC is New York City's design review agency. And so we review hundreds of projects a year, ranging from large scale mixed use developments to small public infrastructure projects like kiosks or street furnishing. Our mission is to advocate for innovative, sustainable, and equitable design of public spaces and civic structures across all five boroughs with the goal of improving the public realm. Um, to support one at NYC and the administration's goals and to provide guidance on how to meet high design standards with equitable and economical urban development, PDC launched a series a few years ago, Designing New York. Um, Designing New York Quality Affordable Housing was our first in this uh, little series that we have going on and it was focused on affordable housing and presented design guidelines and case studies advocating for cost-effective and site-sensitive approaches to holistically design quality affordable quality affordable housing, excuse me. Um, I'll go through, I'll realize I owe some links in the chat, so I'll share a link to our prefab publication to download and to that in the chat later. Um, so Designing New York Prefab in the Public Realm is the second in this series, and as Laurie mentioned, the research started a couple years ago in 2019 with a seminar that Laurie spearheaded, um, and thank you Raul and Andrea and all the students for really leading the charge on this work. Um, we realized the Design Commission that we were seeing a lot of city agencies really pushing in a critical moment to develop uh, capital projects, but you know, with mounting pressures of reducing costs and time and all these things that Lori was speaking to. And so prefab and modular and flat pack and these methods were really popping up uh, in our project review more and more starting in 2018, 2019. Uh, so at Design Commission, we thought that we could use the Designing New York series to kind of take a proactive approach to start navigating, defining, showing um, our, for the capital agencies and with capital agencies, what is possible for the non-traditional building methods. Um, as an agency, we're committed to working creatively uh, within the parameters facing public works, whether it's a small kiosk or large citywide solution for solar infrastructure, as Lori was saying, we're pushing for um, prefab for solar infrastructure for some of these projects, the deep virtual projects are so great. Um, and although housing is so critical and, and prefab as an industry is really being pushed with the affordable housing market and housing and hotels, we really wanted to um, use this body of research as an opportunity to focus on programs in the city's civic portfolio that emphasized public realm enhancements and uh, what community benefits could really be achieved through these non-traditional building methods. Um, now more than ever amidst COVID, amidst the budget crisis, compounded pressures, you know, even more so to reduce costs and timeline and even control construction environments in the pandemic and, and safe environments, um, the city's embarking on design build as well. So we really want to learn more about how prefab can have a seat at this table and be a, a tool for quality design. Um, so I really hope that we can dive into this all in conversation. Just a final plug, we're developing our third Designing New York series, Streetscape for Wellness. So I'll uh, stay tuned for more on that and I'll also share that in the chat. So I'll hand it back to Lori. Thank you and we'll kick off the presentation. Great. So as Rebecca mentioned, we um, I think one of the things when this all started, we saw this horrible trailer that was going into a park in Brooklyn. It was so, I was so upset. I was so sad. And the, I think the city councilman really wanted conversation in his park. And, you know, we're all very sympathetic with that, but you know, why can't we have good design when we're, when we're providing something very quickly? Cause we all know these things, once they get there, they don't go away very quickly. Right. So they end up staying for a long time. And, and I think every borough in the city deserves um, exemplary design. And we that's one of the things we're really here to promote. Um, so we have four really exemplary designers here today, which is 
I'm really excited about. So I'm going to just introduce them um, when they speak. But we have Ronnie Markison, co-founder of Human Habitat, Ben Bushi as uh, principal of Brut Deluxe, Adatola, co-founding principal with um, Giuseppe Lagnano of Lotec, and Carlo Ratti of uh, Carlo Ratti Associati. So, and I know that um, Rui Guan, who is a 217 uh, GSAP alum, is going to present the work first of Carlo Ratti. He's an associate designer and design lead at Carlo Ratti Associati. So, um, we'll start with with uh, Ben with Ronnie Markison, uh, co-founder of Human Habitat, and uh, just to give a brief intro to them, and then I, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ronnie. Um, they are a design build studio based in Copenhagen and New York. Um, the firm embraces cradle to cradle philosophy of design and production products in that, what does that mean? Uh, at the end of their life, they can be truly recycled um, or upcycled. That's another term we'll probably hear, emulating nature cycle where everything is either recycled or returned to the earth directly or in indirectly as food, <laughs> as a completely safe, non-toxic, and holistic sustainability. So that's really their agenda. Um, the firm engages in the circular economy revolution and is committed to creating ecologically vital and socially vibrant communities. So um, when we were searching, we were really so keen on, on I, you're gonna see their work and uh, I'll hand it over to Ronnie. We're so keen on what they're, what they're doing. Well, I'm uh, Ronnie Marcus and I'm from uh, Human Habitat. And this is my presentation. What are the best projects we can design to improve our cities right now? And how do we build it in the most effective and sustainable way possible? Obviously, there's not just one answer to these questions. I'm going to present to you a small scale farm we did a few years back called the Impact Farm. In 2014, I moved to New York with my business partner to study urban farming in a big city content. Our ambition, our intention was to learn about the benefits of growing food in the city and create a project that would bridge architecture and urban food production. In these years, we are witnessing a rapid population growth, a dramatic rate of urbanization, accelerating climate change and health issues. Agriculture and our food supply is a large part of the challenges we face in the world right now, and so it must be part of the solutions too. In all major cities around the world, different organizations and small businesses are responding to these challenges by growing food and creating jobs with social benefits to the local community. One of these organizations is Harlem Grown in New York. Harlem Grown is a nonprofit organization founded in 2011 by Tony Hillary, and their mission is to inspire youth to lead healthy, an ambitious life through mentorship and hands-on education in urban farming, sustainability, and nutrition. They operate local farms in Harlem and have created garden-based development programs for elementary students. They have transformed 12 abandoned lots into thriving urban gardens, ranging from soil-based farms, hydroponic greenhouses, and school gardens. Urban farming is much more than just growing food. It's a way to possibly impact the entire community through mentorship, education, and partnerships to create sustainable change. Harlem Grown's story is truly inspirational, and there are people all over the world who are making a positive impact in their local community through urban gardening. So we ask ourselves the question, how can we help organizations like Harlem Grown through design and architecture? We wanted to create a small-scale urban farm that could be that could easily be implemented into the urban landscape. The design had to successfully combine eco-effective food production along with a social space that could be used in all the amazing work an organization like Harlem Grown are providing for the community. We came up with the idea of the Impact Farm. It's a two-story greenhouse built around a shipping container. The whole project is designed as a prefabricated flat pack farm where all of the component fits into the 20 foot shipping container. The ground floor is used as a social space and, a, and there's a technical area in the shipping container. And the upper floor is used for growing food with a vertical hydroponic growing system called Sipgrow Towers, 
uh, developed by a US company called Bright Agrotech. One of the key element, one of the key design features relevant to this conversation is our construction methods that is designed for disassembly. Most urban gardens around the world are developed on borrowed land where there can be a limited time frame to operate under. By addressing this issue in the design process, we were able to create an urban farm that can be used both as a permanent and temporary structure. This approach has many benefits, both in construction, but also from a sustainability point of view. One day, the materials used in any project will have served its purposes and from our current way of thinking become waste. Designing for disassembly means that all materials can be easier repaired, recovered and reused. All over our cities today, we see old salvage materials being, uh, being used for interiors in coffee shops, cafes, restaurants, etc. What materials are we leaving for future generations to use in their projects? I think it's important to have that in mind when designing and building any project right now. In 2015, we built our prototype uh, of the impact farm in Copenhagen as a temporary structure with a lease of one and a half year. During that period, we held different food events and attracted visitors for, from all around the world who wanted to be inspired and learn about urban farming. After the lease was up, we disassembled the project, packed it in the container and stored it until we can find a new spot for it. The project later got funded to be upgraded in design and, uh, and in technical uh, things. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it was built at a, at a local school in Copenhagen, and it's now been used for edu ed educational purposes. After we had built a farm in pro uh, the prototype in Copenhagen, we got commissioned by Harlem Grown to build a farm on their new lot on 127th Street in Harlem. We had learned a lot from the project in, in Copenhagen, both in terms of how the farm operates, but also how it was put together. All of these upgrades got implemented into the new design. We used a 3D model uh, and we created a 3D, 3D time frame with a step to step guidance of how it was put together for the local uh, contractor. The project got pre, uh, prefabricated at a local art factory in Copenhagen. The all the materials were packed in the container and it was shipped to New York and then it was uh, transported uh, on site. After the arrival of the container, the farm got assembled by a local contractor. Since all of the building's materials were prefabricated all offsite, the whole project was put together in less than three weeks. One of the huge, be one of the huge benefits with this building method besides time is that we didn't create any waste materials on the building site and there was no adjustment to the prefabricated building component. It was simply a matter uh, of connecting the different components together using bolts and screws. Since the farm was completed in 2000, 2018, it has produced food year round. All of the food are being distributed to the local community for free. It has been maintained by a farm manager, the children, families and community members who come together to learn and work with Harlem Grown each, each day. Through this pilot project, Harlem Grown hopes to present a viable model for replication that can help to increase access to farm fresh produce throughout lower income neighborhoods in the urban landscape. Harlem Grown's vision is to transform this space into an innovative urban agriculture center and green oasis for the Harlem community. Thank you, that was uh, my presentation. Thanks so much. And uh, it gives us things to discuss as we go forward. So um, Ben Boucher from Brut Deluxe. Uh, Brut Deluxe Hello. is, uh, here he is. He's an, it's an architecture and design studio based in Madrid and Munich. Uh, it's an extremely interesting model. So we saw one model there where they're in New York and Copenhagen, two people working, bring the project from there. Brood is um, really a hybrid practice. I'm gonna call you guys a hybrid practice. Um, they're focused on, and this is to quote you, you guys, the investigation and creation of space and its atmospheric qualities. Yes. Um, you'll see why. So their projects engage in a huge range of scales of urban intervention 
from ephemeral artistic installations, industrial design, construction design, and urbanism. And also those, those kind of those components in urbanism, we could say in cities. Um, they're truly a multidisciplinary team. If you look at their website, um, I haven't seen many firms that have that many disciplines represented. Uh, they have architects, okay, check, but they have artists, graphic designers, structural and digital engineers, landscape architect, art historian, anthropologist and historian. So they're all engaged depending on a project's objectives, as I understand, um, in the design process. So Brute Deluxe combines both scientific and artistic strategies in their creative process. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ben. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. all the way to Columbia, yes. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. So I'm Ben Busche, I'm the head of Brute Deluxe. And um, I was asked to present um, one of our urban furniture pieces, the Kiosk M. Pauli. And um, it's a direct commission by the city of Madrid, and it's a kiosk for uh, temporary street markets. And when you think about like typical structures uh, that, that are used for temporary street markets, you usually have structures by wood or by textile structures and they take like one or two days to set up and the same happens once the street market is over, you need another one or two days to disassemble them. So the premise of this uh, design is to have a ready-made kiosk which can be brought as one piece on site. This uh, by transportation directly gives us um, a, a, a dimension of two by three and uh, when it's closed, it's sort of a box with this uh, gabled roof. And we called it um, Empoli in reference to the board game Monopoly, which is sort of you, you have these house pieces and this one sort of remembers those pieces from, from, from the board game. But then um, sort of we have this one big element um, to open up the facade and um, uh, when it's turned, when it's flipped open 90 degrees, it's the element protects from sun and rain. And when it's um, open 180 degrees, the house converts into a house with a chimney and at night, uh, like a big billboard, right? So um, we did a lot of testing also with the uh, possibilities of um, the layout schemes on the different squares you could have on, on site. And um, the interesting part about this project for us as designers is that we started at the same time with the construction drawings and we had a company to set up a mock-up in one-to-one -one scale. So this is like our first drawings um, to well, define the geometry and how it works. And it's basically a one space unit. So it's rather defining sort of a little bit detail work. And at the same time, uh, the fabricator started um, with this mock-up, which you can see uh, here. It works a little bit like a car chassis actually. So it's, you have this framework and it works together with the metal sheets to give it its stability. And, um, well, this goes actually quite fast, like after two, three weeks, we have something that already looks quite finished. And as a designer, um, we noticed that like at this point, we have two big challenges. One of, one of the challenges is um, the opening mechanism, which it, it sounds sort of easy to flip up an element 180 degrees, but it's actually quite difficult. And so we, we started drawing um, an element which sort of pushes um, the, this open. This works with a motor and like a screw or drill element and pushing, pushing it up with sort of like, um, um, well, I don't know how the mechanism is called. This worked, but it did create some tensions on, on the element. So finally, we came up together in collaboration with a company and with mechanical engineers with a system that works with uh, two hydraulic pistons. One is pushing up 90 degrees uh, 
acting on this arm and the other one is opening up um, the element uh, 180 degrees in, in the end. And the second um, big challenge of this project is in contrast to the very abstract and archetypal form, um, we wanted a very delicate um, finishing for the facade and uh, it was clear that we wanted uh, metal sheets. This works good for vandalism and it's good for recycling as well. So we took this metal tree drawing and made it sort of an abstract pattern, which is then applied on all the facade elements. And um, this is only possible when you, um, when you work in collaboration with the with a fabricator to make those tests and experiments and um, and when you have a large number of units. So here you can see like a prior state. This is actually like uh, the car chassis with all the, this is the waterproof element, which goes as a whole block into an oven and is weatherproof and the insulation is applied on the interior and the facade is coming afterwards. It's like an additional element. This looks sort of finished, but uh, this is like with the placeholder for the facade. And for the interiors, we choose an adaptation of a commercial system to be able to exhibit all type of products you, uh, you might want to show there. And this is uh, the finished mock-up. Uh, when it's closed, it looks very abstract and then this element turns lifts up like 90 degrees and 180 degrees and this is the final element to push this up and um, well I, I think sort of we we focused on the on the finishing material it's cortine steel with this mechanically pushed in pattern uh, the cortine steel starts to oxidate after a while and gets this beautiful pattern and as Laurie said, so we are very interested in the atmosphere and we like this image very much. It's sort of the expectation you create at night what might be in such a small hut. And then at night it turns into something very different, like a billboard effect. And um, well, once we had sort of this is, we, we had finished the whole construction design and the mock-up and we showed it to the city of Madrid and um, and this yeah that's like the first element finished and then um, we we got the contract to build uh, 275 units so that's when actually sort of the fabrication process starts and uh, you have all those elements at the same time there's still a lot of optimization done and experimentation because we, we do an execution project actually of each sheet. And when we saw this, well, we started again sort of uh, with variations like the interior colors. We, we have eight different colors for the interiors. That's very easy to do. And um, this is all at the fabricator site uh, for the pieces. Uh, waiting to get transported on a truck to Madrid. And when we saw this, we also asked the city of Madrid to apply different uh, uh, safe materials. So we, in the end, we have also this uh, stainless steel uh, elements, which of course transforms the perception of the piece completely. And uh, with these mirror effects and, and the rain on, on the facade, and we have black lacquered uh, pieces. This is easy to do because the facade mass material, as I said, it's just um, like it's easy to change. You apply it afterwards. This is um, brushed aluminum. So then um, the whole sense of this is to be able to, to uh, transport the pieces on a truck and you would be able to, to reassemble a street market just um, in, in Two hours at night and you can just well move them around you just have to plug them in and um, well if you think about like the appearance the perception of typical street markets when they are not in use I think at least it's sort of very different from 
the installation we did for those uh, pieces in, in Madrid. And this, of course, changes completely when they open up and sort of the product uh, takes all the protagonism as that's what is wanted. And um, this project, well, um, it's, it's a little bit older. It worked fine during five years. And then we had the financial crisis. The, the city of Madrid bought uh, these 275 units and they had a contract um, to, for the maintenance and the setup and um, well, they, with the financial crisis, they didn't have enough money anymore. So they terminated um, this contract. And now the, um, the kiosks are placed in public schools, public sports facilities and public gardens, parks, etc. And they're just used as um, storage items. So that's a little bit like buying an, an expensive car and not having enough money for the gas but uh, they just uh, sort of sit there and they're used to store the pool uh, items, but it's still a beautiful car. So um, some of them look a little bit shabby, but they are almost indestructible. So probably they will be there in 50 years. And um, some of them are kept really nice. And you, when you come to Madrid, there, there's really a lot of them and you just, um, you, you will cross one uh, for sure. Well, that's uh, sort of uh, the presentation for, for today. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions uh, later on. Great. Thank you, Ben. It's so Thank cool you. to see like an expanded um, development of it and its afterlife, uh, so to speak. Um, okay, great. Um, so I'm going to also now introduce Adatola. Uh, and of Lotech. Lotech's known, I think you all know Ada here at Columbia at GSAP for, for their innovative work, specifically with the standard we saw in the first project, uh, the second project, the first I, the ISU shipping container. And Lotech is known for its innovative practice and specific focus on this specific shipping container, which is really to me, it's just an amazing thing to that they have devoted their work to this and, and the amount of creativity um, that it has expanded into. Um, in their commitment to working with this, I'm calling it the ready-made in like the Duchamp sense of the ready-made uh, for their practice, they've explored and adapted this, they say durable, flexible, and of course, incredibly sustainable object because they're not going away, they're piled up all over the world um, to architectural applications. Their stellar example of upcycling extends the life cycle of these already manufactured objects and expands the potential of existing systems and explores the futures of legacy platforms. So in their design for cultural and institutional projects and residential houses and housing with this component, I think they've just um, exploded and it just seems an unending proposition, which I'm really excited to have here. They are the experts of the shipping container and they've also proposed architecture out of the ready-made, such other ready-made, such as cement mixers I hear and airplane fuselages. I'd love to see those um, out of other ready-mades. Um, we're extremely fortunate to have Ada Tola and Giuseppe Lignano as faculty at GSAP and Ada's here today to join the conversation. Thank you, Lori. I'll share my screen. So uh, I would like to start with an acknowledgement to all workers and also uh, for the indigenous lands we occupy, a quote from Joy Arjo, a writer and poet laureate of the Muscogee Creek Nation that I really, really love. And she says, in reference to sustain the need for artistic expression, I believe that if you do not answer the noise and urgency of your gifts, they will turn on you or drag you down with their immense sadness at being abandoned. So in Lotech's case, the word is upcycle. We start with upcycling because of the shipping container, or we start with the shipping container because we must upcycle. We begin with the 320 square foot of perfect court and steel enclosure which we drag out of its back of the house, anonymous and exceptional global network into specific new uses, new massing, new spaces. 
because we begin with a volume existing and heavily used before we reclaim it, we work and have always worked off-site as well as on-site. Prefabrication has been with us from day one. Um, I will start by showing you the witness studio. The Whitney Studio upcycles six 20-foot containers to squeeze into the Whitney Museum Broyer Building Moat on Madison Avenue and be occupied as a space for art education and art making. A single operation on the assembly slivers the cube diagonally, generating windows and skylights and a double height within. This is the beginning of the off-site work. It begins with selection and then with steel modification. The containers are modified in a shipping container facility, in this case in New Jersey, conveniently closely located, painted black in this case to best interact with the existing Broyer building, which we love, and then inserted with great care into the tight moat of the museum. In the off-site, on-site split, Logistics are part of our work. We design and devise the how-to all the way. So you see here the building going inside the, the Whitney moat, uh, which was quite complex. The building is a landmark. Uh, the, the Whitney is a landmark building. And we had the set of lawyers from the building inside, right behind the window, watching the assembly, which was <laughs> quite exciting. But we had to devise this system of tracks so that the containers could be positioned and slide down below the cantilever and right next to the bridge of the existing museum. And all of this to say that some of the technicality for us are complex, but also very inspirational. Here you see the building in its uh, final form and the idea of its kind of mute presence that is both interacting and uh, revering the existing building and how uh, it looked from the inside of the museum, providing a glimpse to the activities within, but also uh, independency. Uh, and then the sort of surprise of the interior space with the double height and the white background for art making and art exhibiting. So when the Whitney moved downtown, the building was donated to Socrates Culture Park, which obviously is possible only because the structure could be disassembled. This goes to what Ronnie was saying also about moving uh, uh, his parts. Uh, and uh, the Socrates requested a design expansion that could include a larger art education and exhibition areas and some, some administrative spaces. So we designed the cubes, which starts from the Whitney Studio and repeats it three more times, two equal volumes and one open and ghosted volume for outdoor use. Um, the building is located right at the entrance of the park, will be located right at the entrance of the park, uh, to the right on this kind of niche uh, amongst trees uh, that are um, that is right there, lifted uh, to uh, respond to flooding. And uh, I want to shift your attention to um, drawings, uh, both as a technical and artistic expression, uh, which uh, for us is a really important uh, overlay. So our construction drawings had to be reconceived uh, as we started working with containers uh, from the onset of our work to include a sort of a, a container schedule or a catalog of each container that had to be coded and drawn through all its sides. Uh, this is the portion of the drawings that goes to the fabrication shop, to the workforce that will be in charge of offsite construction. This is the proper prefab. And this is where knowledge uh, includes also a lot of structural and fabrication knowledge. Uh, and I wanna bring this up because uh, precisely because we work with containers, we actually had to invent a new form of prefabrication or a sort of construction technology. And this process required the real knowledge share, a deeply collaborative attitude working with manufacturers on one end and engineers on the other. And uh, what we ask manufacturers, uh, and in particular uh, on the trails of the big uh, American industrial might, uh, we ask them to um, 
engage with projects that, uh, in stark contrast with the more repetitive setup of their work routine, uh, are instead unique, challenging, uh, and different. And what we asked engineers instead on the opposite end uh, is to engage their incredible knowledge to this very elemental application on a simple volume or box, uh, considering its infinite uh, variations and iteration. So the projects rely on this very tight team uh, to allow us to transform these box or boxes as we all operate within existing carbon footprints from design to engineering to manufacturing and back to design. Um, shifting attention again, uh, in all of our projects, the connection between the technical and the expressive is a, a very important connection. And as we produce drawings to understand how to be most efficient and now to not waste anything, uh, as we say, how to um, kill a pig and use all its parts, um, we also ask ourselves, can a drawing be prefabricated? Or how uh, can we prefabricate a drawing? How can we make a drawing that is very close to the work itself, that follows the same logic, the logic of the object, rather than the, object, the logic of the white sheet or the white screen, uh, the material selection and the conceptual and physical operation of layering, cutting, removing in our case. Uh, here you see Puma City, which was a particularly complex project because the building had to be assembled and disassembled multiple times at 11,000 square feet of space. And the drawings that we did very much to explain to the trades how we did that uh, ended up also being the drawings that represent the project. This drawing is right now in the MoMA collection and on the MoMA walls uh, very proudly for us. So please go see it. Uh, so the, the, again, I want to uh, uh, highlight the importance of this connection uh, and also uh, look at these projects for their larger scale. Um, and then one last thing, I want to go back to um, a home that we just completed that is really a, a prefab at a bigger level because uh, the modules in this case were completely uh, retrofitted and is an attempt for us to systematize some of our knowledge. So this is a single family home that comprises six fully transformed shipping container units, entirely retrofitted prior, prior to the delivery. You can see the kitchen just being deployed with insulated walls, windows, appliances, and fixtures. Uh, Siom is a pre-designed system that utilizes repetitive spatial solutions and details at different scales to offer a variety of sizes and configurations. Uh, this is the house it is, as it exists and is inhabited right now. And um, I want to conclude just saying that for us, uh, while to prefabricate is really to fabricate before, um, I would argue that our work is also uh, a sort of a fabricate after. And maybe that what Lotech does is post-fabricate or that we even unfabricate, um, which is not the same as dismantle, although some dismantling is always necessary and not just from a fabrication standpoint. Thank you, Thank you. Ada, fantastic. We're going to conclude um, because I see some questions popping up too um, with Carlo Ratti, Carlo Ratti Associati, so Rui Guan is going to present, uh, oh, there's Carlo, you're here. No, 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 I've been, I've been here listening. Sorry, I, I, Rui, is, um, uh, Rui is based in our New York office and also he's a Columbia University graduate. So I thought Rui should be there because I couldn't, I was just a bit late at the beginning. So I think it was good for him to, to be there. And Rui, you could take some of the questions if you want. Okay, great. So Rui, yes, we're re really excited that he's a 2017 GSEP graduate. And so that's fantastic. I don't know if he speaks Italian too, but um, he's an associate <laughs> designer and design lead at CRA. So just to give a brief introduction for uh, Carlo, Carlo Ratti is a professor of urban technologies in the urban studies and planning program at MIT, where he directs the Sensible City Lab. There it is, um, Carlo Ratti Associati 
is based in Turin, Torino, um, Italy, and also New York City and London. Uh, and the office is currently involved in many projects across the globe with scales ranging from product design installations to architecture and urban planning. Uh, the office explores the intersection between the natural and the artificial in the built environment, offering often leveraging uh, digital technologies as part of a multidisciplinary mission to innovate in the urban landscape. So um, Carlo, I'll turn it over to you and thank you for coming to Columbia. Thank you very much, Laurie. It's a great pleasure. You know, under normal condition, I would, uh, I would be there with you in person. I've been many times and I uh, loved it every time. Great. Now, I changed a little bit my presentation also after seeing the beautiful presentation by Ada. Uh, so I, I wanted to start by sharing with you a project we did actually during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we were all asking ourselves, what can we do? in order to actually contribute our skills uh, in order to help with the, during the crisis. And so we certainly, you know, so we started a project called Cura, which is connected units for respiratory ailments. And so COVID has changed the way we work, uh, that's for sure. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that we started sharing much more. You know, during the crisis, we started sharing much more. These are our, you know, some colleagues uh, at MIT did this kind of event project in, in open source and many people started using open sourcing. Uh, even companies like regular companies, commercial uh, ventilators here, you know, companies such as Medtronic, one of the leaders in ventilators decided to open up design specs and code for free to all. And, uh, and so we were inspired by this and uh, we were thinking, what can we do? Well, you know, um, people focus on different things, but one thing is for sure, this we are talking about last March, but unfortunately, this is still true today, we must expand ICU capacity worldwide. And uh, so we started this in, um, in an open source way. The amazing thing is that, you know, this was just at the very beginning, we immediately got the team that grew to over 2000 people involved in the community helping to design this. And our goal was, you know, is there anything we can do in between the two, those things? So you see, something can be deployed rapidly, would be easy to scale up, would be responsive and agile, but also would allow to have biocontainment inside. One of the tragedies we've seen across the planet is that a lot of makeshift hospitals, you know, were quickly mounted, but then, you know, they didn't have biocontainment, so a lot of people got sick and got COVID at the time. And your bicontainment is done by actually creating negative pressure and putting very special filters. So you create negative pressure, that means that all what is inside the container or what is inside the unit doesn't go out. And then you take air out only after sterilizing it with special filters. You can use ozone filters, you can use EPA filter, very, uh, very special EPA filter and so on. And so anyway, we, we started with this design. This was the first version, how we could put two um, uh, anticipatory units with bicontainment. And we decided to use containers. I mean, that's why I added the project after, you know, I know others work very well. We also make ones at, at MIT. Um, but so I, um, I, I we, we, we said, you know, containers uh, can leverage an amazing infrastructure for building, for making, for moving around the planet, for shipping. You know, one problem also is if you don't use modular structure, it's very difficult to move things from one city to another city. And what we know now about COVID is really that uh, the front line is switching. The front line was in Milan, went to Madrid, went to New York, you know, then uh, one city after another city. So you want to be able to move things fast. So this was actually our first project with containers, but it turned out to work very well. You see here the plan, you, see, you can see here the initial design of the the section for the nature design. You can see here the exterior and interior fit out uh, and you know, an image of, uh, of the inside with all the components. That's really two intensive care units in a container, you know, very super quick to mount. Just half an hour, you put the container, you connect it to power in the other, uh, power a few other things. And, um, and then you can also move it very, very quickly. And then, you know, you can do different configurations. You can do an annex to a hospital like this. 
uh, with an inflatable structure in the middle, you can do a field hospital, as you see here. You can also, you know, make it bigger if you if you need. And you know, these are three configurations, but you've got many others. Now, the interesting thing is that you know we started this in uh, March, and just in a few weeks we had one built. Um, that was also thanks to <clears throat> the sponsorship of a major European bank called Unicredit. Um, and they believed in the project. So we had the first one built and installed actually in a, in a real hospital. What you see here is a real hospital. Um, you see the inflatable part, uh, you see the, the inside, and uh, you know, these are some of the images of, uh, of the container here. You can see actually to the left, you see some of the other, uh, of the other bags in the hospital. And the interesting thing is that you know, all of this, as I mentioned, was done in open source. And uh, so then we started seeing, still today, there's people all around the world using the drawings and uh, for fabrication, some of them changing things. So these, these are some of the initial uh, prototypes we saw, some of the initial units we saw, uh, you know, coming from all over the world, people taking our drawings, adapting them for, for the conditions, maybe changing a few things here and there or the color. Um, and, you know, again, this happened with uh, projects in, uh, in the UAE, in the UK, in Italy, in Greece, in the US, in Canada. Uh, one of my favorite was actually a company in Canada. And the main business of this company is actually to produce containers to grow marijuana. But they decided during the pandemic, actually, they would download the drawings from Cura. And instead of doing containers for marijuana, we're doing containers for ICUs intensive care units. And, uh, and here you see again, you know, this is another company who's been doing it in, uh, in the UK, very similar to the one we prototype, so really copying everything. And for me here, the story was twofold, was probably two or threefold. You know, first of all, <clears throat> well, we know that today we can fabricate without modularity. The good thing about today is that we can really digitally fabricate without being modular, but sometimes modularity is still important. And uh, if you want to do something, you can move around, they can use the infrastructure we have in, in our cities, on the planet, you know, ships and so on, cargoes, then modularity is important. So the first one we wanted to make is that, again, even if today we can have, you know, think about Catera, we actually started a similar company in Europe, you know, smaller, much smaller company, but you know, we can fabricate whatever we want without modularity. We don't need modularity, but sometimes modularity is important. And that's what we learned with, uh, with Curacos. Now, the, the other thing um, is that uh, uh, open sourcing becomes very interesting. And you know, open sourcing creates a system where more people can work in parallel, and also you get a lot of feedback loops. You can really speed up the design by open sourcing. And that continues when you start building. You know, people were building and uh, uh, you know, sharing information. There were some groups on Reddit uh, uh, constantly, it's probably still on. I haven't given check in recently, but you know, the, we know for sure that uh, many companies are, 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 are fabricating right now using our drawings. And, and so open source is interesting. I wanted to make an analogy here. And it's an analogy between the artificial and the natural world. You know, if you think about it, the virus is code is code that replicates in the taxes. I'm talking about COVID, but every virus and so on. And you know, in the same process of code, the code of DNA that then replicates is what is the, is the principle of uh, you know, natural evolution. And if you do open source design, then you know, we're taking a similar approach. Is opening up the code of intelligence, the code of design, and then together we can replicate much faster and fight better. We would never have been able to do this. Uh, you know, this is a said, in just a few weeks, we went to the first prototype, prototype in probably three months there were people fabricating this around the world. Well, we could follow a standard system, you know, a standard process, which is, you know, you design it, you maybe you patent it and, and so on and so forth. You know, the same thing would have taken at least a year. So somehow, you know, by sharing, we can, we can be much, much faster. Um, and, and the final thing is about feedback loops. And the third point I want to mention about feedback loops. Now, feedback loops are the key things that happen in nature. You try something, you see the feedback, and you know, that's what determines if a design in nature is successful or not. And by design, what? Maybe I want to say, you know, by the, the code of, of an organism. 
And well, the same we can apply to, to design. By doing this, we can really open up a lot of feedback loops and fabrication allows for that. So anyway, the principles of open source design I want to share with you. By the way, I, uh, I did a book on open source a few years ago. Actually, the whole book was done in, in an open source way with different people contributing to it, uh, from Jonah Bracken to uh, uh, Joseph Rima to uh, um, Paolo Antonelli to Nicholas Negroponte to many others, Hans Ulrich uh, But uh, so if somebody's interested, it came out with uh, Thames and Hudson a few years ago. Um, and uh, but basically, principle of open source design, you know, share first, no patenting. And competition is good. It's not bad. Anyway, so next steps as well as we're looking at this for the longer term. Um, by the way, this, so the global south needs Cura, more Cura still today. And so how can we help them scale up and use, uh, use the drugs? Now, following this, I want to share with you a couple of other experiments. And in these experiments, you use actually a similar approach. As I said before, you know, today we don't need to be modular. But there are some cases when you want a little bit of modularity, and there are some cases where you want to apply another principle. It's actually a principle that uh, was developed by um, a person who I think is, uh, was, was one of the great uh, designers and theorists in the past century um, by Dutch architect John Habracken. You know, John Habracken in the 1970s really worked a lot on how we can involve people more in self fabrication or what Enzo Mari called autofabrication. And um, well, you know, his idea was in a nutshell, it's a bit much more sophisticated, but in a nutshell is, you know, as an architect, you want to provide a framework and then you allow people to, to build inside the framework. So you want to give them like a structure and then they provide input. Now, this is a very simplified way to, to summarize John Habracken's uh, uh, approach, but you know, just, uh, just for the sake of conversation, we could talk about this much more if you want in the Q&A. And as I mentioned, Jonah Bracken was one also the uh, authors of the book. We, we did an open source design a few years ago. Uh, and so I want to share with you very quickly two projects. One is called Living Board. Uh, it's a commission from a nonprofit in India. Nonprofit is called We, uh, sorry, not We Work, We Rise. And, uh, and uh, We Rise wants to uh, provide housing to a lot of people who today live unfortunately, in very unhealthy conditions in urban settlements. And, and so here the idea was, you know, well, how do you do it? How do you provide a, a, a structure to them and the basic conditions? And here again, we use a similar approach to the, the Habracken approach, and we call it living board. It's similar to the motherboard concept you've got in, uh, in, uh, in electronics. So we said, well, if you go there with uh, an element that you can fabricate before, before uh, you know, you put it on the land and then you allow people to build their home in it. And you put it on the land, by the way, that's also important because uh, it, uh, it, uh, India has been devastated by a few earthquakes recently. And so if you, if you, you can insulate it uh, from a seismic point of view from the ground and you put all the, all the expensive, uh, uh, you know, things there about, uh, uh, about services and then you allow people to build whatever they want above it. And you see it here, so the, the, the living board is what you see at the bottom. It has a few extensions that you see there, also on the top, if you want to put photovoltaics clearly, you need to go to the roof, but basically you allow people to build the shell they, they want. And you see it here, you just, you know, you put this, very simple foundations, depends on where you are. Uh, you're getting your seismic insulation, and then, uh, and then you build the top of it. And, and then you get something like, you know, where you allow people to, to then make changes and personalize and really do what they're doing today, but making sure that they get the main standards for, for living. So that was, that's the first one. And actually that uh, happened more or less in parallel to another project where we use a similar approach. Again, inspired by the idea of uh, structure and infill. That's a, 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 it's an eco retreat on the Himalayas in a beautiful place, um, very close to, uh, Darjeeling and Kalimpong, uh, just, you know, if you're, you're, you've got beautiful views of the Kanchenjunga in 8,000 meter mountain uh, in Sikkim, uh, the same one that you see from Darjeeling, where the Darjeeling tea comes from. It's a beautiful place with these, uh, you know, waterfalls and tea gardens. And, and here it was very similar. Again, we wanted to involve the local community to, to help build it. We didn't want to do this, fabricate the whole thing 
in, um, you know, in Mumbai or uh, in Germany, in Italy, and then ship it there. We wanted to, to involve the local community, but at the same time, the local community doesn't have all the skills to do, to get to the standards that um, the client wanted to get. And so again, we, we said, okay, so we fabricate part of it, and that's a frame, and we allow the infill to be produced locally. And again, by involving also local designer, local people. So again, we by open sourcing the design, we provide an initial design by allowing this to change. This is currently on site, is the previous one. And you see here, you know, some of the possible configurations for this. This was inspired by a lot of the local materials in the region next to Kalimpong. Uh, it's all up in the mountains, so even if it's India, weather is very nice, but uh, during the, the winter can be a bit, a bit chilly. Uh, you know, when winter beauty, weather is beautiful in January, February and so on, but uh, it's a cold season. And so that's why you want to have a, a, a fireplace as well. It gives you some of the outside, you know, this, uh, these panels are what is fabricated locally, but also with many variations. That's kind of our initial suggestion, but uh, that's what allows then this to be uh, configured and uh, redeveloped by sharing the drawings, we would share the initial drawings, and then the locals would, uh, would both fabricate and fabricate with variations. And here's a view during the night, and we, we really like, you know, uh, in, uh, especially when the weather is very, very mild all year round, a bit chilly during the winter, yes, there's a bit of rain, but really the house becomes this kind of uh, um, a very, a very subtle and gentle skin. Uh, you know, this almost like you know, it, when when, it, when the lights are on, it almost looks as it's made by paper. So, so you don't need to have thick walls. Uh, that's what the locals do as well with the, the the houses they fabricate. You know, use wood and you try to create this very thin surface to protect you uh, from the elements. So, anyway, uh, those were some of the the, the, the things I wanted to share. Uh, again, you know, the things to. Uh, the, 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 the key points I wanted to, to make are about, uh, yes, you know, fabrication can really be very exciting in many contexts. Uh, we can fabricate today without modularity, but sometimes modularity uh, is important, as we saw in Cura. Uh, and then don't think about using the same system for the whole house. If we open source, we can both open source design, execution, the modification of the design. And then in those cases, it's interesting to think about how we split different parts, maybe a more standard frame that is fabricated, prefabricated, and then infill, which is uh, you know delegated to uh, to other people. So anyway, that's what I want to share with you. I think I I've run out of time. Oh, it's perfect. We are we we have um, if everybody hangs in there or those who can, we wanted to spend about twenty minutes or if we can um, 15, 20 minutes on some questions um, for the panelists and then open it up and I'm going to start with one that I'm gonna combine with one of the questions that we received uh, today. So uh, I guess to start off, I think Ada's there, maybe she's there somewhere anyway. So how has using these systems in the public realm positively impacted both the public, the public and the process? Um, and could you then also, um, touch on some of the misconceptions or negative misconceptions and positive conceptions that misconceptions, positive aspects that are lesser known. So how have, how have the systems in the public realm positively impacted both the public and the process, public uh, in, and process, right? Well, the, you know, the misconception is one, is very simple, right? The container has a stigma for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now I would say almost it has a double stigma because when we started in the early 90s, we were beginning to see shipping containers and therefore the biggest st stigma was the idea of it being this kind of low object, right? That, that doesn't maybe want to belong to architecture, that belongs to something else. Uh, but I think that the, uh, the second tier is also the fact that now is really the the item that symbolizes our global economy. So mm -hmm. it has also this added layer uh, as this uh, sort of like background object that we all recognize, but that is really the, the mule of our economy is the thing that is doing all the work in global economy. And uh, uh, so in a way, um, 
I, I would say that the most important thing probably is uh, precisely the shift in attitude. Uh, I always advocate for the fact that by using ordinary objects, what we are trying to do is first and foremost to allow us as humanity to look at the things that we make, concoct, invent, uh, engineer, uh, and understand ways to, um, to think of them through their potential, not just through what they are. So to be able to relook at things with different eyes. And uh, I think our practice tends very much towards that. So it's an idea of, um, you know, it's interesting, one of the conversation that uh, was uh, very much there through mm -hmm. also the other presentation was, was this idea of uh, how can we reduce waste? How can we reduce waste locally? But for us, it's more how do we reuse waste? <laughs> so it's even more central is the idea of we are surrounded by these boxes. And I always think of our work as a work that builds a legacy. Uh, I think that I hope that what we will leave, and this goes also to what Carlo was saying, what we will leave is a set of drawings and samples and sketches and the many projects at very large scale, very large scale that we haven't built that will stay for humanity in the future to try to understand what to do with this huge amount of steel boxes that are around. Mm -hmm. Great. Other, any other comments, responses? Ronnie? I think, think right? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, well, during this whole process that we've been, uh, we've been, uh, when we've been doing this farming project, uh, we've only noticed from a lot of people they could, that they could see this kind of solution happening many places in the world. And, and we have been, ever since we, we did the project, we have gotten responses from all over the world that people want this in their, in their local environment. And I think for, for us using the shipping container, they, they've been able to see that even though we've been miles apart from, uh, from where people are living, that they can still see this kind of solution being implemented in, in, in their place. And I don't think we would have succeeded in that if we didn't use the shipping container in our, in our storytelling in, 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 in what we've been doing. So for us, it, it has been a very positive uh, uh, response from everybody in terms of uh, in terms of prefabrication. I think somebody else was was Ben starting or no um, was it Carlo no no for me like the 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 biggest advantages about prefabrication actually as a designer is to be able to uh, experiment mm -hmm. in instead of. Uh, the, the typical process uh, where you just design and then you bid and it's built. Uh, if you collaborate directly with a fabricator, you can uh, you have a quality control. You can test. You can uh, instead of a one directional process, you have a process where you're actually sort of uh, testing during months and getting optimization of elements. And of course, you have like the, the waste. Uh, you, you, usually, when it's prefabricated, you can disassemble it, and you can uh, you have a much better waste control. So, for as a designer, I it's it's not like prefabrication is um, like an ob object in itself, but it just uh, facilitates a lot a lot of things during the design process. Okay. Great. Carla. Yeah, building building on that, just a a, a, a quick thing is. You know, certainly if you want to move to a circular architecture, we need to fabricate. <clears throat> we need to fabricate because then we can have all the elements, we know what they are, in the same way we assemble them. We can disassemble them. But the other thing I wanted to mention that's quite interesting, and you know, it might inspire some of the, the, the people that say, you know, we had a very interesting convergence we were not aware of. You know, we, we've been working recently with uh, two colleagues, uh, good friends, uh, with Anton, uh, Garcia Abril, who's a colleague at MIT and also the founder of Ensemble uh, Studio. We just finished a project in, uh, in Europe together and uh, also with Philippe Wan uh, from China, also teaching in the US. And the interesting thing is that without knowing, all the three of us built a factory as an annex to the office. So, you know, we got a, not a big factory, but a, a place where we can use digital tools to fabricate, you know, 
five or 10 years ago, all of us would have like, you know, a 3D printer in the office and a laser cutter. And we do the model, started making models inside. Well, even 10, 10 years ago or more, but you know, that was the, became the norm everywhere five years ago. And, uh, and I think now, you know, if you take that and you scale it up, and you know, scale it up, I think uh, the, the, the biggest one is uh, Anton's one has this kind of beautiful factory he, 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 he built in, uh, in Exeter, Cambridge. Uh, ours is in, is in Italy, Philip is in Shanghai. Uh, but basically it's really um, uh, a, that same thing scaled up. And that really, as you just mentioned, it allows us to, to test things first, uh, you know, to, to build more circularity because we can check new assemblies, new assemblies of material. And certainly I have no doubt that the way we build at home 10 years from now is going to be much more similar to how we build the plane today. You know, everything is going to come, be, come from a factory and then be just mounted perfectly and magically thanks to the guidance of a digital model. Mm -hmm. Well, to you, uh, Carlo, I think it's super interesting idea that we can use uh, or like set up this kind of factory network, um, both in US or in China, we can start with this kind of outsourcing uh, design approach and fast repro uh, reproduce all the these kind of cu either Cura uh, prototype or other kind of prototype that we can um, uh, let the world know that all the all the factory can produce in within a certain time frame uh, that we can contribute to the the world either in the amidst the COVID uh, situation or other other situations. Mm -hmm. Actually that perfectly kind of leads into one of the questions that we kind of had um, repeated from the audience that, that Laurie and I had chatted about earlier, which is what does, um, you know, we're talking about a lot of what prefabrication, you all defined it in your own ways, which I thought was really interesting. We, we uh, you know, in the seminar, one of the first things we did was we had to define it for ourselves. Like what is prefab, what is flat pack, what is modular, what's the line between it being a component of the typical design bid build process versus this new, less traditional uh, method. So um, one, if you could all speak a little bit more of how you define it for yourselves and then also speaking to the process and what it enables. Um, Roy, you were just talking about what it enables in a factory setting and process, but um, you know, thinking of the Public Design Commission's charge and hat, what do you think that, that then allows in the public realm that perhaps the design bid build or more traditional model would, wouldn't allow as easily to kind of give back and enhance more equitably the public space? Long question, sorry. <laughs> Super long, long question. Um, I, I guess, I guess oh, like prefabrication definitely is quicker and possibly much more kind of accurate uh, compared with traditional building methods. And sometimes it means uh, easy for changes and fast reproduction. And uh, for example, success, a successful prefab or modular project can be duplicated to many other areas and so enables a more kind of e equitable potential for the public realm. Um, I think the Cura project is a perfect example for that. I, I, I'm also going to second the, the idea of the, obviously, the, um, you know, uh, efficiency that is both time uh, and quality control, which is a very important thing. Being someone who practices in New York and having been uh, practicing in New York for almost 30 years, uh, I would add that I think that uh, that's what I was also trying to stress in our presentation, that the the very tight connection with fabrication, with who does the work is a very important thing. And that uh, means that um, uh, one has to really think about the kind of networks around a potential project, where does a project exist and what are the networks of fabricators around. Uh, and uh, in that, I think that in New York, um, the bidding process is, uh, I mean, this also to respond very much to your idea of like, what are the, the difficulties? Uh, the bidding process that instead wants to be an open process mm -hmm. uh, creates a little bit of a crush with the idea of instead um, precise relationship and precise knowledge. So I think these are the things that one has to tackle with, especially working at public at, at the level of the public realm and public projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
in my opinion, like prefabrication is so widespread that it's actually just um, a question of up to what grade you uh, prefabricate. And it's usually it's limited by transportation, nothing else. If you look at current buildings, it's like, uh, like most of it is prefabricated and it's just assembled in a way sort of that you can transport it on, on the street. Uh, so uh, on, the, on the other hand, sort of if you, the concepts or mis, misconceptions you, you have, usually architecture is understood as like site specific and everlasting. And this goes in contrast to prefabricated or what people usually understand for pre, under prefabrication. When it looks prefabricated, usually it's understood like temporary or uh, like less um, less quality. I think it's it's uh, absolutely wrong. Like you can prefabricate in a very high standard or even in higher standards, and probably sort of even if if authorities would introduce like a, a requirement for waste management, we would have the entire building like prefabricated because it, it definitely makes it easier to, to disassemble. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, it's rather when you design, it's rather a question about sort of um, uh, how, up to what grade do you introduce sort of your, your the prefabrication in, in the building structure or in the transportation or in, in your own like perception of the building, the more re you reduce, um, the less materials you, you would use, the more, the easier it is to, to make it prefabricated. I mean, it's I know Carlo, oh, okay. I was just saying, do you think the line now is so blurred? Is it an outdated term? And yeah. kind of bundling that in with the other questions. Yes, but Rebecca implies that we think we're using an outdated term. <laughs> we think we're using an outdated term, and as I think Azada and others have noted. But Lori and Rebecca, I think, I think what some of your, your, your work and, uh, and, and what some of GSAC could really contribute to is to actually get a better terminology, because are, and what was mentioned now is totally right. You, know, you say prefabrication, that goes back initially to the modular by the Corbusier, and then right. to all these experiments that failed. And they failed precisely because they were low quality. They, could, they didn't have the flexibility for that, both neither to the environmental condition nor to the living conditions inside. You know, somehow we're talking about something different now. Maybe you want to call it factory fabrication. And that's, you know, that you can do something, the same things you can do on site, even more flexibility in terms of variations, and you can do it much higher quality. And let's face it, it's the only way to be circular. There's no industry. You know, if you think about traditional construction, it's the most, um, you know, the, less, the least optimized industry. You know, when you, you make a wall and then the next week you got uh, people running cables and knocking down parts of the wall. And then you got again people coming to fix the wall. I mean, it's, it's just a mess the way things are built on site. We know it. Um, there was a report by BCG a few years ago that we looked at the level of digitization of different industries, construction was together with hunting and fishing at the lower, at the lower. So I think the only way we can digitize, be precise and be circular and create really amazing buildings is if we go, if we embrace factory production. So somehow, you know, I think, but I think what, what you could really help also with this discussion is really get the right terminology because sometimes people are going to be confused. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so are there, are there key roadblocks? I mean, Ada was speaking about it, about here, this briefly, but that we didn't touch upon in the presentations. Has the design process and roadblocks changed recently? I think Carlo speaks about and, and, and re speak about kind of working in kind of dual locations. Um, you know, what has changed? What, what additionally has changed? Because this is all moving so rapidly. And I think people have preconceptions, obviously, about the pre what prefab is. We use the terms to kind of bring people on board, but then we want to take it apart, right, to, to really say, well, what is this today? Unions are roadblock. I mean, I usually very sympathetic of unions, but in New York, they are blocking a lot of, uh, of this. Yeah, I know they had to do lots of cartwheels to get around that for some of the um, the housing and also for Garrison's project. I don't know if Ada has run up against that in terms of, because you have 
who hooks up the plumbing, who hooks up the electrical, right. getting all the right. nitty-gritty of this. Yeah, but part of it is exactly that, that this idea of this uh, share, because there's a moment where you have to bring the responsibility, right? In this on-site, off-site, you have to drop the responsibility in the hands of somebody else. And it, it, that's a critical moment, of course, and it requires a huge amount of collaboration. So. Uh, that that's that's complicated for sure. But I also wanted to say a little bit in response to uh, uh, Carlo and Ben that uh, yes to the factory work as we can. Although I was highlighting the issue of network because I do think that transportation is an issue. Transportation impacts the sustainable aspect of the work. So it is not just transparent. I mean, it is not just irrelevant, is very, very relevant. And, and that to me is, I wanna also give a little bit of pushback because if, you know, I know we're talking about New York and New York is the very first world. So we're all happy to be here. But having worked in South Africa, in Johannesburg, I can tell you that ideas of prefabrications are radically different and skills of making and technology of transformation are radically different. And part of our task, I think, is also to understand how to respond to very specific conditions, uh, not just to go top down, uh, because we enter realities that have their own richness and there is an exchange every time we intervene. Right, I totally agree. Um, yeah, and maybe building on that, not you know, location specific, but you know, in the midst of this pandemic, I'm talking about how can prefabrication respond. You know, Laurie and I were talking before the event of, are there now new ways that we can push both New York and others to to go more towards realizing the the potential of prefab and modular in the pandemic? You know, are there pros that we can speak about of front loading certain aspects of the design, kind of delaying others that allow it to optimize? In, you know, in this pandemic condition, um, do you think that's a, a next step and a potential? Is this specifically a question for me? <laughs> I mean, I, yes, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, I showed us the last project, the house, although it's a, it's a residential project and it's not a public project, but it's, it's interesting because it's a project that is getting a lot of friction for us right now, precisely because of that, because it stands in this place where it's, is both pre-designed, but also is very customizable. And I think that there is a real interest right now for people to enter exactly that place where something is not totally done, but it, but some of the thinking has already been, been uh, pushed ahead. So, um, so yes, I, I think absolutely so. And since many of you teach, I just want to wrap up with this and be mindful of the time. Um, and we've been trying to incorporate some of the questions that are coming here on the, uh, the chat. Um, but since many of you teach and we have a lot of students in the audience uh, through an educational lens, um, how can students be pushing the envelope on this topic? So, you know, how would we think differently about this? Are we? Thoughts on that? I, I'm going to say very quickly, as you know, uh, having been in school, <laughs> in the same school, under the same school roof for many years, mm -hmm. I'm a big advocate, a big advocate for the fact that students should really try to understand what their personal in interest and intention is and mission in a way. So um, I, I think it's very important to expose students to other means and other ways. Uh, and to let them really consider what it means right now to practice and not to just default to default modes. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay, great. I, I would say very, very quickly, uh, something very trivial, spend more time in the Fab Lab. You know, I learned a lot of this when I was a, a PhD student at MIT in the very first Fab Lab that Neil Gershenfield did in the basement of the Mid Lab. You know, if, you, if you're able to manage it in the fab lab on a smaller scale. You know, the same thing you can manage, it's just a bigger machine. You know, you go from a, a from the small laser cutter to a big router to cut uh, XLAM, uh, you know, CLT, cross-laminated timber, but it's really the same thing. So very simple, just, you know, spend your nights in the fab lab. Great. 
Totally agree with Carlo. I think spend time making, not just on your screen. That's a huge yes. lesson. Yes. And not talking, making, not talking. That should be the <laughs> not talking. Okay. Any pen? Anybody else here? I, I have one. Uh, Ronnie? Well, yeah, well, so since we, we, we did the whole project ourselves from, from start to finish, uh, so, so we did all of the... When, when we started designing the project, we knew that we had to build it at some point. So, so that, uh, and I have a background in carpentry. So mm -hmm. I knew that at some point I was, would have to stand and, and put everything together. Mm -hmm. so, so that helped me a lot in, in the way that I needed to think about the project and in terms of how things were put together. So I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing to have in mind when, you, when you're designing is that at some point you have to give the drawings to, to somebody who have to build it. And the simpler you can construct things and the simpler you can start uh, uh, taking things apart from each other, uh, the, 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 better, the better end product I, I think you can get out of it. So. Great. I don't know, Ben. No, no. Okay, I'll um, end and say thank you so much, you four, four and five, for presenting your incredibly ins inspiring work to all of us. Um, and you know, we I always say we want to make the world a better place. You know, we're incredible optimists as architects. I mean, we're internal optimists, and um, I just you know so appreciate the work you've done. And I know it comes with a lot of labor. <laughs> A lot of extra labor. Thank you. I hope to see you all, all very soon in person. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Very, very soon. We're getting yes. back to Nathan. on a good note. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Oh, thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thanks so much. <laughs>